We've known each other for a good number of years now and go... Uh, we were both old. <laughs> we were both old when we met, right? <laughs> and I had a chance to, uh, we had a chance to visit today over lunch and uh, kind of catch up with one another and, and everything. And God is using her and blessing her and she's going to bless us. So we're delighted to have her with us tonight. Would you help me make Marsha work? I told Kenny, I, I'm not the best guitar player around, but I love this song because I was so lucky to become a Christian in the Jesus movement because it was very uncomplicated. It was love Jesus, love each other, the end. <laughs> some real pickers on it. Um, <laughs> but I had so much fun writing this one. It was from, yeah, I often steal sermons and make them rhyme and that, you know, it's easy that way. And uh, <laughs> I always ask permission, but anyway. Um, this was from a sermon that somebody was giving talking about Isaac when he was sent out in the desert with all of his clan and all of his animals. And he went and tried to uncap the wells of his ancestors. And they said, you can't do that. Get away. So he had to go dig his own wells. And that's kind of what we've done. And the reason why we can do it is in this song. Well, they struggled in the desert. They were parched and dry. Till Isaac found them water so they would not die. But the owners came with a mighty yell. You're not our kind and your animals smell. Get back from the water that is not your well. Dig your own well, dig 
Secrets thought you were the worst Till you came to the water That could quench your thirst But the preacher called you a Jezebel Said you're not our kind And you're going to hell Get back from the water That is not your well Dig your own well Dig your own well Don't hang out where they hate and condemn They can keep you We're not here this morning. Any, oh, some of you. Okay. So this is the very first song that I ever wrote. And like I said, it was the beginning of the Jesus movement. So we didn't have any music yet. Um, we had Southern Gospel, but we didn't pay attention to them. And uh, <laughs> we needed to write our own music, you know. So when I met the Lord, I, you know, it was... It was such a clear experience for me. And I remember, I was 16 years old, and I remember staying afterward to pray with people at this, I'd heard people talk about Jesus as though he were alive, which was very disconcerting to me. It's like a science fiction film, you know? Jesus told me to do this. Jesus, I'm thinking, the Jesus? And Southern California, good chances they could have had somebody named Jesus, right? But anyway, I stayed afterwards to pray, and I remember kneeling down and saying, I'm just so full of foolish pride. And even in my own 16-year-old ears, I could hear how old that sounded. But I just wanted to give up. And the first thing that happened was, you know, I felt that burden lift. I was an hour from home at a place where my cool um, kind of uncle had taken me. and. Um, so I knew I was going to have to go home. I was going to be in trouble for being late. And there was no way I was going to go home and be good and be a Christian now. And they said, yeah, that's actually not how it works. Because if you were everything you wanted to be and everything you needed to be, you wouldn't need Jesus anyway. And so they said, you know, Jesus, they were very nice about this. Jesus gives you the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to live as a Christian. Nobody told me I had to do any tricks. And... So they laid hands on me, and the first thing that happened when I prayed for the Holy Spirit was I felt like I was one of those kids in Jesus' lap, and I just knew that he was big enough to contain me in my world. And then he took me by this river. I could hear it. I could see it. I could feel the spray in my face. And I remember thinking, with this much water, no one should have to be thirsty. And Jesus looked down at me and said, I was there every night you cried yourself to sleep. I was there every night. That's why I died. And you know, everything in my life changed from
from that moment, and it never went back. It not only re rewrote my future, it rewrote my past. I mean, it made me look back and go, that was you. You know, like he'd been there all along. He hadn't waited for me to get it right. He hadn't waited for me to do the right stuff or, you know, understand the right theology or believe the right religion. He'd been there for me all along. So when I wrote this, I just wanted to tell my kid sister and my friends about it. You said you'd come and share all my sorrows. You said you'd be there for all my tomorrows. I came so close to sending you away. But just like you promised, you came there to stay. I just had to pray. And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried. I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. Your goodness so great, I can't understand. And dear Lord, I know that all For those tears, I 
out that didn't go over so well but um, <laughs> but it was that was the first song that was called contemporary Christian music and that's why you know I told people this morning I, I met uh, to me a young woman less than half my age is young and um, she was doing this you know she's taking notes on her iPad for an article she's writing and she said you know introduce meeting everybody around her and she asked my name and she said oh I think you're in the encyclopedia in our break room. <laughs> so, you know, I'm officially reached old age when it happened. But it was the first, it was the first contemporary Christian song that was called that. And so they kind of couldn't write me out of the history books. You know, that was a big problem. Christianity Today said, she is conservative Christianity's worst nightmare, a Bible-believing, God-fearing, Jesus-loving lesbian Christian. <laughs> Sign me up, you know? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I had, I had such great friends. When I first became a Christian, I got razzed a lot in school, you know, because I was a hippie, thank you very much, from Southern California, and hippies weren't supposed to, you know, become Christians. And so I got teased in class. Even I hadn't even had teachers that said, you know, well, let's, let, we're going to discuss what is truth today, and Marcia, just give us a break and stay out of it. You know, really, they would say that stuff to me. So I was kind of accustomed to that. I, I knew that, I, I mean, I don't know, I was reading the book of Acts. They did that to the disciples, too. I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. But it really served me well when I came out. And, you know, people had all kinds of things to say. But the best answer that I ever heard anyone have when I was talking about, you know, people who are marginalized, the Bible is filled with people who are marginalized that God calls to the center. And I was recording in Nashville. I wasn't living in Nashville at the time. I was recording there, and there was some big hoopla over somebody that got in trouble for something that people decided wasn't Christian, and they wanted to take away their Dove Awards and, you know, stop selling, stop playing their stuff on the radio. And there was one Christian bookstore, not a Lifeway, one Christian bookstore that was still selling their CDs, and they, the radio guy actually called them, you know how they call live, they do live calls, he called the owner of the bookstore and said, I understand you're still selling so-and-so CDs, and he said, yeah, we are. And he said, well, didn't you hear what happened? He said, yes, we heard. We still sell the book of Psalms, too. <laughs> we are the children your disciples sent away we are the lepers turned back at the gate we are the eunuchs not allowed to enter in we've been told our loving is a sin but you have a plan for just like you said you would You have a plan for us It's only for our good We found you when we looked for you With all our heart and soul You said that we could call you You promised you would hear us You've given us a future and a hope Future and a hope Future and a hope We're the adulteress you protected from the stones. We are the one in ten, give or take, that came to thank you all alone. We are the prodigal, the prodigal you saw from far away. Yet you run to meet us just to say that you have a plan for us. Just like you said you would, you have a plan for us. It's only for our good. We found you when we looked for you with all our heart and soul. 
You said that we could call you. You promised you would hear us. You've given us a future and a hope. We are the woman at the well, the blind man you told not to tell. Samaritan, the outcast, and the lame. The harlot and the thief, disciples lost in grief. And yet you've given each of us your name. Just like you said you would You have a plan for us It's only for our good We found you when we look for you With all our heart and soul You said that we could call you You promised you would hear us You said that we could call you You promised you would hear us You've given us a future and a There's nothing gracious about taking a slug, you know? Um, <laughs> I know that we've come across this more recently, but over the years, there have been people outside of the gay and lesbian community who have really stood with me, some of them kind of very privately, but you know, they want to let me know. And some, sometimes people have just spoken from their hearts and filled with the Holy Spirit, and they say it in front of everybody, and then the world comes crashing down on them. And I think most people know that Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, recently did that. He said, of course I'd marry gay and lesbian people, and you know, they have the same spiritual walk that I do. And then Lifeway said they would never sell his books again, and they, they own the, the copyright to the message. So they would completely take the message off the market. And so he, he didn't exactly recant. He said, yes, of course, I believe in the biblical view of marriage as one man and one woman. <laughs> it's like recanted enough to get them to sell his stuff. And I understand, you know, people go, oh, you know, they're just so into the money and that's why they gave it up. But that's really not true, I don't think. I think that there's, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to stand up. It takes a lot to be out of the closet and to make that choice to really follow where God has led you. I'm, I'm doing a seminar um, in a couple months with a guy who started out writing me as a kind of a hate letter. <laughs> and <laughs> I answer all my hate mail. Peggy Campolo says I should, I should put a note on my website that says, Marsha's taking a hiatus from hate mail. Please write again in October. <laughs> um, <laughs> important, not only does the Bible tell us to give an answer, a reason for the hope that's within us, but I, because it doesn't hurt me, I'm glad to be the one to do it. Anyway, so this guy, like, first of all, he started with, everybody, does everybody have to start with the, my sin is no worse than, or your sin is no worse than mine? Like, everybody has to go through that phase, right? It's just a phase. Everybody has to go through it. And, you know, so he came around, well, his daughter came out to him, big surprise, and, uh, <laughs> And I ended up singing at her, his daughter's wedding. And anyway, we've become friends, and even his wife has come around. His wife has come around more emotionally, but he was a theology professor. And it was a bit, like, when he wrote to me, he said, I, I can't even tell you how shocked I am that you wrote back and that you know scripture. Fluent <laughs> <laughs> King James. Um, <laughs> comes in really handy. Um, but anyway, I, it does take a lot. It takes a lot to... Just stand where you are. And, you know, my granddaughter said, you know, everybody wants to say, I would have hidden Jews in the attic if I was in Germany, and I would have been on the Underground Railroad, and I would have marched with Martin Luther King Jr. But here we are. Right now is the time to do that. Maybe it's 
not even wise It's so much easier to fit in To remain in my disguise Maybe I'd have wealth and glory Maybe they would know my name your beauty under scars of lies and shame so when they will not play my songs and say I am despised they did the same to Jesus so I should not be surprised if you take up your cross you can't say that I lied There's always a chance You could be crucified And so you pledge your heart to Jesus You'll be who he made you be To those still trapped in the domain of secrecy Oh, the way may not be easy They may call you dyke or queer They may say abominations are not ever welcome here Take up your cross. You can't say that I lied. Say that I lied. There's always a chance you could be crucified. so funny this very sweet woman had to sing that line they may call you dark or queer like studio singer Margie do you know Margie um, and she said she the first time she couldn't sing it she stopped and she's like um, okay, oh, you just do it again and I <laughs> and the other backup singer said yeah it's okay Margie you don't have to sing it we'll sing that part she looked at me bright red spots on her cheeks and said no People have said that to you, and if you can go through that, then I can sing this. Now run it again. <clears throat> Something about an author who starts with ever after and turns the pages backwards as he writes. Many often question such eccentric methods, leaving all his critics 
weeks wondering why. But the master storyteller already knows how each mystery develops. He starts with the end in mind, pens the last chapter before the first line. His characters don't need to worry of uncertain fate. He sees how the battle ends. The dragon is slain before he picks up his pen. Someone of such vision is certainly one of a kind. He starts with the end in mind. Something about a sculptor who sees the stone's potential before the mallet calluses his hand. Many often question such peculiar methods. Simple minds could never understand. chisel can see a woman in a flawed piece of marble. He starts with the end in mind. Polish the statue before it's designed. The monument doesn't shed tears over what's chipped away. Naming it more than rock. The figure is freed before it's chipped from the block. Someone of such vision is certainly one of a kind. He starts with the end in mind. Something about a father who names his sons and daughters before the dust is ordered let there be many often question unexplained behaviors having eyes and yet they cannot see Secrets knows our fears before we even think to feel them. He starts with the end in mind, pens the last chapter before the first line. His characters don't need to worry of uncertain fate. He sees how the battle ends. The dragon is slain before he picks up his pen. Someone of such vision is certainly one of a kind. He starts with the end in mind. Something about an author Something about a sculptor, something about a father who starts with the end. You know, way more than answering my hate mail, I answer a lot of emails from people who are absolutely convinced that they're going to hell, and they either they're terrified or they've you know they've just decided that they hate God or there is no God or whatever. And for some reason, they feel compelled to write me. Now, the people who write hate mail, I always want to go. How's that working out for you? You know, a lot of people just falling at the altar after you. you, you really, you know. 
But the people that write, they're so scared. I, I understand that they're writing me because they want me to write back. And so I've had this ongoing uh, one with this one woman who's been, in, she's in a long-term relationship with a woman and she's, she's just terrified that she's wrong and that she's going to go to hell and, you know, and don't you ever worry about what if they're wrong, uh, you know. And um, so she's decided not to have anything to do with God, but she really can't do that. And so anyway, I've been having this conversation with her and going back and forth. And most people who are like that also speak fluent King James so that I can communicate with them. And so, you know, I was talking to her a whole bunch, of, you know, back and forth. We've probably, I don't know, had 10 or 12 letters back and forth. And finally she said, I'm really afraid that if I turn my heart over to Jesus, he's going to take my wife away and, and just, you know, make me not be gay anymore. And you know, not everybody agrees with me, but I always give the same answer. He might, and you have to serve him anyway. And she was just like, what? And I said, well, you know, it's okay with me if God strikes me straight. God can make me five foot two. God can give me blue eyes. God can make me left-handed. I'm pretty sure that actually God got it right the first time, and I'm a five nine right-handed green-eyed lesbian. <laughs> I should be a flying purple people eater in there somewhere. <laughs> but you know what? I believe that the plan God has for me is the best one there is, and I want to be in the middle of it no matter what. So um, five days later, she wrote me back and she said, you know, I'm starting down a path and it's not just that I don't know my way and I'm trusting God to guide me on this path. I didn't even know there was such a path. I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to fill me or get slain in the Spirit or speak in tongues or fill, you know, have so much emotion. And she said, I realize that's not even the kind of relationship I want to have with the Lord. I want to have a solid you know, ongoing, day-to-day, minute-by-minute, breath-by-breath relationship. And I didn't even know that existed. So the bottom line is, I've decided to trust Jesus with my wife and with my life. I came to know you early I was young and full of care Dying to be saved from my despair My life hung in the balance I cried out to you in prayer I needed to be saved And you were there and I cried, save your, I cried, save me, my life an open book, my heart an open door. I found salvation, I found safe harbor. When I was young, I learned to call you Savior. Then I perceived your power, learned your mercy and your grace. I came to know your miracles in us. You called life into being. Your word could calm the storm. The sovereign over all, my Lord Jesus. between us 
I have learned to know your voice When I'm afraid I don't need to pretend My heart is yours, I've found love Others cannot comprehend Today I call you Savior, Lord and friend I call you Jesus I was at a concert one time. <laughs> oh, this is so bad. So probably 100 people there, but there was a guy in the back row that just glowered through the whole concert. Now, being your typical diva, everybody's having a good time. I'm concentrating on the guy who's frowning because, of course, it has to be about me, right? You know, you know the definition of a diva, it only takes one of us to change the light bulb because the whole world revolves around us. And... <laughs> he would leave. I thought he would walk out, but he didn't. He stayed for the whole concert, and so uh, as I walked out, I went past him, and he was like in a suit and tie guy, you know, and he was trembling all over, and I said, are you okay? And he said, I can't even begin to tell you what just happened to me. He said, you know, in the past, I've been a Baptist and a Catholic and a Mormon, and people laughed at me because they thought, oh, you know, I was just going on whatever trip. But each time I thought I had found the church, I thought I had found the truth, the place that would make me straight and good and right with God. And every time I got kicked out when they found out I was gay. And he said, over 20 years ago, I swore I would never darken the doorstep of a church again. And I had this friend just nag me to come to your concert, and he said, I finally told him, fine, I'll go and critique it for you. I could so see that. I was waiting for a 2.6 to go up in the back. And um, he said, but about halfway through the concert, I felt the spirit of the Lord fill the room, and it made me furious. He said, I just wanted to stand up and scream and say, so what am I supposed to think? Is it the real you this time, Jesus? And he said, the soft voice in my heart said, well, you tell me, Steve. Is it the real you this time? And for the first time in my life, I could say yes. My aching heart had hunted you, longing to be known. But each time I was asked to leave, left to seek alone. Out of the closet, out of the church, out of the prison of the search. I swore I'd never beg again or hide my face in shame. This is how you made me, so I won't take the blame. Since I've learned to live with the doubt What's this yearning in my heart tonight about? Is this the real you? This time the real you? I want a truth and only learned to lie Is this the real you? Oh my child, I'm waiting here 
longing to be known. I left all of the world behind to look for you alone. Out of the heavens, sentenced to death, saying I love you with every breath. You know, um, <laughs> I wrote a book, it's in the back. Simon & Schuster actually op optioned the book 
and you know, gave me all these editorial blah, blah, blahs. And then they decided it was too religious for them. <laughs> it got published by somebody else, but I just thought that was so funny. So they sent it to their religious section. You can imagine what they did with it, yeah. So, but anyway, um, I thought this would be a fun sing-along while we do this. I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I wept for Jerusalem today. Wept for her children far away. Wept for the pilgrim destined to roam. And I wept for the warrior on his way home. And then I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I left my tears, I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I sang where Silas taught us to sing. I prayed where Mary risked everything. I heard the songs and ancient chants, flung up my arms and started to dance. And then I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I left my tears at the wailing wall. Call your people to joy. Tears in the night bring joy in the morning. It is our strength. Tell the whole world the story. You brought your children from slavery to glory. Then you called your people to joy. I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I, I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. I left my tears at the wailing wall. You call your people to joy. You call your people to joy. I actually wrote that one in Israel, um, and I was telling Kenny about that trip. Um, we were supposed to go on a big fundamentalist trip, but my wife, my wife's Catholic. She doesn't really know the Bible. She knows the Boston Catechism or Baltimore Catechism. So she had the whole living room table all covered with a map of Israel, and she had gone through the Old Testament and typed out stories and put them on the map so that she would know where things were when we went, you know? And a week before we were ready to go, the church called us and said, you can't go. And, you know, I said, can we pray about this? And they said, we already have prayed. And um, they actually had to pay us out of their own, it was too late to cancel, you know. They had to pay us not to go. And the most amazing thing that happened was that this young, straight son of the man who had started that church <laughs> called me up. And he said you know, I just heard about this, and um, I just want you to know that my church has decided that we're not going to leave anybody out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you'd like somebody to lead you on a trip of Israel, my wife and I have been a dozen or more times. I'd be glad to do that for you. And he said, and you can bring any gay and lesbian Christians you want. <laughs> and then he called me up and said, you know, there's a, an unmarried couple at our church. It's a man and a woman that are living together, and they're kind of not you know, it's not a popular decision with their family. Would it be okay if they came? <laughs> I think we can let them in, you know? Um, so it was, it was a wonderful trip. And, you know, I'm so blessed because I have the best wife. People, when I go to their church, you know, when, I, when we join a church, we move somewhere and join a church, people think they want me. They want her. She's on every Habitat build. She's on every mission trip. She's there volunteering to put the kids' backpacks together and do VBS. And I mean, she's just like an energizer bunny with an extra set of batteries. And, and she just loves the Lord. And so um, I kind of wanted to share this song because it was the song that I wrote for our wedding. Hold on, just one second, I'm sorry. And I just want to say that so many straight weddings, I've heard them use the words that Ruth said to Naomi, whether thou goest, I will go. And I want to go, find your own scripture. <laughs> You were 
young when you first knew you would be alone holidays and family ways would never be your own a guest at every wedding an extra place at meals but nothing ever seems to feel quite the way home feels. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. I will come to love your people. Your God will be my because it messes up my voice. Okay. <clears throat> now we stand on sacred ground. Our family's near. Law allows these holy vows. Your home is here. I don't have land or riches. I bring my heart alone but this one gift I offer you a family of your own. wherever you go I will go wherever you live I will live I will come to love your people your God will be my find like a better cup or something that is less obtrusive. Um, anyway, so my wife, she's so cool. Um, sometimes she travels with me. For a long time we traveled together in a bus. But, um, you know, we got older. And uh, <laughs> that can take it out of you. You have no idea. Um, but she's just one of those people, you know, she doesn't know the Bible very well. She doesn't actually exactly talk all the time about somebody going to church or whatever, but I don't know anybody in her life, and she's a big corporate hoo-ha at, at HCA headquarters in downtown Nashville. Nobody that I have ever known has, that has met her does not know she's a Christian. And part of it is just that she sees people who are invisible. You know, she was, uh, she was one of seven in a Catholic home, and she, you know, left home early and knew she was different and wrong and bad, and she got way into drugs and alcohol. Most of her 20s, she lived on the streets. In fact, I had told Kenny she can't scuba dive with me anymore because her sinuses are so scarred from all the things that she sniffed. You know, she can't equalize. But anyway, when she tells her story, it's people are really touched with it. And the thing is that she, I don't, I don't mean to overlook people. 
I always have trouble when, when somebody walks up to me in, in public and wants something from me, you know? But she's like, she's, she knows all the homeless people where we live. She knows what tent they stay in out wherever, and she knows whether the one guy likes croissants from Starbucks, and you know what I mean? She knows all this stuff. And, but even like the, the people who do the boxing at the grocery store, she knows them all. She knows whether they're like working their way through school, or whether they're differently abled, and this is their first job. She just knows everybody. It used to be when we would pull the bus in somewhere and somebody would say, over there in space three, all I saw was their finger. I wanted to get to space three and get to bed because we'd been driving. And she like met the guards at the tower. She knew what night the guards had Bible study. I mean, she's just that kind of person. And, you know, I had to ask her one time how she could do that all the time, how she could constantly reach out and not just feel drained and put upon and dragged down, you know? And I know that a big part of her story is that she actually became a Christian at an MCC. So she didn't, you know, like if she got saved at an MCC, that wasn't a big issue about whether she could be gay, right? So she had that knowledge from the beginning that she wasn't stuck on plan B. She wasn't on some, you know, alternate plan, had a great plan for your life, oh darn, you turned out to be gay, you know? She knew all along that this is plan A. And you can leave here tonight on plan A for the same reason that she could. Well, I asked her how she could always reach out like that, and she said, because I've been there. She never passed a lonely soul she failed to greet. The gardener pulling weeds, the beggar on the street. The ones who seem invisible, the addicts gone astray. I never really noticed them until she stopped to pray. And when I asked her why she seemed to always care, she could only answer, I've been there, I've been there. I begged to die in pain no one could share. I've been there. So many times I see the tears fill wounded eyes. Some church has thrown them out or filled their mind with lies. They feel they are invisible. Their hearts have grown so hard. abandon them because of who they are. Jesus, how can you reach through such despair? Then I hear you answer. I've been there. It took the cross. It took the cross. It took the shame. Oh, shame. It took my blood so you would know. I felt your pain. I've been there. Could 
share I felt the wounds, I took the scars I can meet you where you are I can heal your pain Cause I've been there Christ says don't leave before you say A simple prayer you can come from death to life Cause I've been there Ooh, I've been there Lord Jesus, we do come before you now always wanting to remember that we go out of here ready to minister to a whole community of people that nobody else is banging down the doors to get into. If we don't tell them about you, no one will. Help us to be instant and ready to give a reason and answer for the hope that's within us. And just help us to remember right now that there are things that we can leave at this altar. We, there are things that we can leave in this room. You said that, that your kingdom not doesn't was in heaven, but it's within us. We can pray with the person next to us. We can pray where we are and let go of addictions and angers and betrayals and, and bitterness that we don't have to leave this room with. We just really pray that you'd leave us all, lead us all out of here on plan A, knowing that the plan you have for us is the very best one there is. God be with you till we meet again. By Christ's counsel, God uphold you with a shepherd's care and fold you. God be with you till we meet again, till we meet, till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we